Thank you very much. And thanks everybody for joining today's presentation. We're gonna be talking about, in, talking about enabling business agility with open technology. Over the next half hour, I wanna examine you know, some of the problems that, that businesses have or the challenges with agility, and really go into what is agility, uh, what is the industry doing, particularly the communities and, and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation to enable companies to achieve a higher level of agility than it's ever been able to be done before. When I started thinking about this uh, topic uh, and, and writing about it, you know, one of the things that really came to mind is, uh, most of you probably don't know, um, I'm a competitive, competitive obstacle course racer. Um, and I found this definition extremely pertinent to the topic we want to talk about today is that, you know, as we're going through a, a, a race, a trail race, an obstacle course, um, you know, we find the need to respond to unknown and unfamiliar terrain and obstacles kind of around each corner. Uh, there's, you know, many things put in our path to uh, challenge us, to keep us from being successful. Their competitors are also going through. And it's, you know, who could get through there the quickest and, and come out ahead? Uh, and to do so, we really have to call on a variety of skills uh, you know, necessary to kind of overcome these challenges that are placed in front of us. Uh, whether it's you know, the obvious ones of arms and legs of navigating the terrain and, and climbing through and over obstacles, but then also the, the sense of sight, uh, mental acuity, balance, you know, all of these play in concert with each other, working together with split second timing and accuracy uh, you know, to make uh, an obstacle course racer successful uh, in getting to the end. And, you know, businesses today really face many of these types of challenges, challenging terrain and obstacles every day. Uh, and, you know, vast majority of them knew that they've got to figure out how to navigate uh, quickly uh, in a competitive environment to keep from being disrupted um, or left out of, of customer opportunities. Uh, and so these can be in the form of business requirements from regulators, international rules, GDPR, uh, or maybe in the form of opportunities, you know, new products, new channels, uh, customer uh, uh, segments that they want to enter, um, or new technologies. And then there's the changing requirements in the area of customer expectations. You know, customers you know, are coming, you know, we, we use the term, term uh, consumer uh, They're used to immediate response, immediate gratification. And so as customers see and experience new ways of interacting with customers and, and develop new expectations of response times of where uh, service is going to be uh, provided and how they want to interact with you, and a business needs to be able to respond to that. Uh, So how can you enable you know, the numerous roles in the company or even the partner ecosystem to work together to seamlessly deliver the new capabilities at the speed of today's business? I would propose it's through adoption of the rapidly evolving cloud native uh, application and in, in infrastructure model. Many people think that cloud native is simply a way to describe applications that are run in a public cloud. But the truth is that that phrase is not really so much about where an application runs, but rather cloud native describes a broad approach to delivering applications. It's about how applications are designed and built, how they are tested and released and deployed into production environments. And it's about how they are managed as well. Now it's true that most cloud native applications are deployed on a cloud infrastructure, which could be in a private cloud or a public cloud, but where is really irrelevant. It's about the how that matters. At the heart of the cloud native approach is about delivering better software, faster and at scale. And your path toward delivering applications faster will ultimately be one that takes you to a more cloud native approach. With that said, let's get into why and how of cloud native. The cloud native approach is vastly different than a traditional waterfall development model and goes far beyond just being an, uh, an agile 
development model. The first striking difference between cloud native and traditional models is the application architecture. Monolithic is definitely not the way applications are done if you want to succeed in a cloud native model. Cloud native applications are instead built from many independent microservices. Independent in that they can be deployed and run as standalone software services. They still ultimately come together to form a complete application in the end, but now the application is organized in a loosely coupled way. And this is really transformative and a key enabler in this business agility. Now there's no more waiting for the slow guy. You can push your set of microservices through the delivery process independently. As soon as any microservice has completed one phase, it can go on to the next. No need to wait to deliver all the functionality as a single release. This means that new features can come out incrementally, microservice by microservice, allowing us to deliver new capabilities more rapidly. Also, since microservices are small, they require less people to code to test, to deploy than the complete application would, and therefore more efficient to deliver. Now it's possible to restructure our teams. We can put everyone needed to drive a microservice through its entire life cycle into a single DevOps team. And these teams are likely still quite small. And this changes the thinking and culture uh, among the team by emphasizing end-to-end you know, -end ownership of the software. In practical terms, it, it results in better integration and management of the work needed to move the microservices through its complete life cycle. Finally, and of critical importance, the process we are looking at here can be highly automated. In fact, end-to-end -end process orchestration is the most valuable of all cloud-native traits. It's, it too is enabled by microservices. Their independence allows microservices to plug into an orchestration process. And this kind of automation is a great revolution in software delivery, as much so as the first factories were to manufacturing. Automation not only speeds delivery of any one microservice or application, but the overall orchestration dramatically increases overall production capacity, efficiency, and quality allowing many applications to be produced faster and more reliably at a lower cost. The culmination of all of this uh, is to reduce application delivery cycle time significantly from many months or years to a few weeks or even hours. And we do it in a way that can scale so we can deliver numerous applications at great speed. So there are many facets that contribute to how cloud native applications get developed, delivered and run. Analogous to the many skills of an agile runner, let's look at what each independent cloud native domain brings to the table. And then we will put them together to work in concert later. So each row here highlights a different dimension of cloud native. From left to right, we see the, the historical progression as technologies and capabilities have evolved from the traditional model to cloud native uh, over time. And we get to the far right when we say that we've really achieved a cloud native computing model. And the good news is it doesn't necessarily have to all be done at one time, uh, moving everything from waterfall, monolithic, uh, physical data center infrastructure, all the way to cloud uh, native computing. So these can be chosen in increments that make sense for your environment. And each piece will add incremental value as you go through the process. Uh, but ultimately, the, the kind of one plus one plus one uh, definitely equals greater uh, than the sum of its parts. Uh, so you ultimately want to get all of these uh, put together at some point in the, in the future and have a vision and a roadmap for how you're going to get there. So the first point here is that cloud native is automated. You can think about the move from agile to DevOps as expanding the agile team and process to include operations folks and processes as well. Agile teams that initially test and or initially included only developers uh, have consistently grown to also integrate test and release teams, reaching further to incorporate ops in the next extension of the model. 
it's been an evolution, not necessarily a revolution. But as we, there's also, this is also where we introduce the idea of orchestration. Because as we focus on the process, it's the orchestration that really brings it all together. Remember that we are dealing with more moving parts than at any time in our history. So many microservices rather than a few monolithic applications. And the teams are small. So orchestration is essentially required to repeatedly do this process. If we want to deliver applications faster uh, and at scale, the app orchestration is an is absolute essential. And note here that uh, kind of looking ahead, um, the blue ships wheel is the Kubernetes logo, and it's really the leading orchestration platform for containers and one of the hottest open source technologies today. And it's a platform that you're most likely to use sooner or later if you're not already. And we'll come back to this uh, more in a few minutes. As we discussed, the move to DevOps involves changes to our organizational structure as well and to the way we think about our responsibilities. People become part of the application team rather than independent functional teams. And this drives shifts in perspective uh, and thinking about what our responsibilities um, are and the priorities. And that in turn impacts the culture of the organization. And a cultural change can be a lot more challenging than just embracing new technologies. Despite that, this evolution is happening across all industries and it's being successful. And so if you're practicing agile development today, you're already proven that you can make that sort of change and make that first step uh, along the journey. So cloud native is also about container or componentization. And you know, looking at one of the key aspects of that architecture is this notion of microservices. Uh, microservices are the key enabling uh, incremental change uh, that delivers shorter cycle times and allows us to deliver incremental uh, value instead of having to work at a, a monolithic level. By breaking the application up into smaller pieces, we can introduce new capabilities uh, rapidly without having to wait for a complete validation of the entire uh, system. A good approach to implementing microservices architectures is to start with a greenfield application. There's a lot to learn and it's generally easier to do when you're unencumbered by accumulated technical debt, typical, typical of applications that have been around for a while. And once you've developed some sort of expertise on the distributed systems and the microservices architecture, fine-tuned the design, development, deployment, and management of it, then is when to take on some of the more existing uh, monolithic applications. And even in those, you're gonna wanna analyze them to determine which ones uh, need to be refactored and which ones should, are better off just left uh, alone. You know, there are many that may just not be worth the effort uh, to redesign. But if you look opportunistic, opportunistically at them, uh, you should be able to identify areas where there may be just sections of code that are good for refactoring or certain functions and services that you want to add to an application. Uh, and that's a good way to, to think about breaking it down uh, and really being needs driven uh, as you do go through that process. The next aspect is about its weight. You know, container or cloud native is lightweight and portable. You know, container growth was really driven initially by developers. You know, containers are a way of packaging the code, uh, distributing and delivering uh, code and being able to, to make it as, as portable as possible. Um, and this worked out great uh, for the developers. You know, they're fast, uh, e lightweight and easy to use. Uh, and developers can deploy and manage them on their own often and particularly, you know, testing them out and validating even on a, as simple as a laptop before moving into a, a larger uh, IT ecosystem. And most compelling is the containers run consistently almost everywhere. Why is because they include everything they need to run, the application code and all of the, the operating system dependencies that may go along with that. 
Um, so as they move from development to test to staging and production, uh, it should continue to work consistently across all of the environments. And this virtually eliminates the, the historical challenge of, hey, this application works on my machine uh, problem, uh, where an application fails in production or the end user is having a problem with an application, but the developer uh, doesn't see that problem in their environment. So it's a great uh, um, opportunity to, get, to, to solve that issue. Uh, containers also make moving code around much easier, uh, which increases the developer productivity and streamlines the dev test stage production workflow. Um, they can also take a good deal of stress out of the software updates, whereby they only need to update the, the specific uh, service um, that is changing uh, and therefore just delivering a, a, a specific container uh, rather than taking down an entire application, scheduling a weekend to, to do a, a monolithic update. And finally, cloud native is abstracted. Uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, cloud native is really about an operational model and not a place. And as the technologies matured, and containers uh, be, uh, evolved to where they can run essentially on any platform. Now that's taken it so that it's not just in a cloud and it doesn't even need to be in a core data center. Uh, the container technology and cloud native technology is stretched and federated all the way to the edge, uh, enabling edge and IoT devices and, and applications to be uh, delivered and supported in the same uh, cloud native model. Uh, which greatly increases productivity and, and flexibility, especially when you want to make incremental changes uh, in far distributed um, applications and maybe push to the edge, where historically you would need to do an all or nothing update and a monolithic um, update that could essentially be many gigabytes. Uh, and doing that is very time consuming, very uh, bandwidth consuming. Here you can continually deliver uh, incremental capabilities or make that update to a specific uh, service uh, and uh, continue to operate and it's done in a much lighter, much quicker uh, methodology. So let's look at the maturity progression um, that this, uh, this process in adopting cloud native takes you through. Um, you'll grow to kind of realize all the benefits um, over time. You know, starting at the, the lower right hand corner, you know, as you move toward the cloud native approach uh, to application delivery, you improve upon your software cycle, uh, life cycle management processes. Through automation, we realize productivity and efficiency gains, and we increase the reliability of the software releases. Those increased reliability releases make us more comfortable with releasing software more frequently as we do it repeatedly and, and see the success in that. Then moving to the, the lower left, uh, by introducing new capabilities more frequently and incrementally to users, we speed up that feedback loop, allowing us to respond more quickly to feedback. And this helps us build the right product for our customers, the ones that the users really want and, and value. And you can see which ones that they value through either A-B testing uh, or other types to, to really get a good uh, assessment of, of what users are wanting and make changes uh, fairly uh, real time. Uh, and you can also in this, it helps us identify problems more quickly. And since releases only change things incrementally, the release cadence can be rapid. And we can also quickly implement and release fixes, uh, thereby raising the quality of the software. And then finally, bringing it home. So now that we've improved uh, or provided uh, the needed capabilities at a high quality, that of course leads us to improved customer satisfaction. And because we are able to achieve that goal rapidly and remain responsive to changing needs by continuously delivering applications faster, we can stay ahead of our competition. And this is how we grow our business in the digital economy, even through challenging times. So I promised we would get back to the orchestration piece. And so let's take a look at that. I do want to, cl to clarify a key point, um, the difference between automation and orchestration. 
sometimes we use those uh, interchangeably, uh, but in, in reality, they're, they're not. Uh, automation is really about uh, essentially automating or referring to uh, a single task or a small number of tasks in, in relatively linear fashion, where orchestration arranges the tasks to optimize a workflow. For example, orchestrating an application not only means, not only means deploying an application, but also connecting it to the network so it can communicate with users and other applications, and also adjusting and dynamically responding to scale and response time needs. So automation without orchestration is brittle and difficult to maintain. So here is a depiction of a common uh, software development process. And when we look at the ways to deliver applications faster via automation and orchestration, this is the macro view of the processes we want to automate or, and orchestrate, I should say. Uh, you know, the green chevrons identify the life cycle phases of dev and test, and release and deployment management. And the first part is really where the application developer uh, side comes into play. Uh, you know, the application life cycle, uh, kind of put in through the development and into test uh, before moving it into production. And the responsibility, as I said, really falls in application development. Uh, the second part of the application lifecycle takes place uh, in the production environment where the work of deploying and managing the application happens. The work done here generally falls under the umbrella of application operations. And applications also need infrastructure to run on. So underlying uh, the applications and supporting the needs of the applications and the teams working on the applications is the foundation of infrastructure. A lot of work goes on at this level as well, making sure that the infrastructure is available to run the application. So agile development and early DevOps began to provide automation across the, the application domains, but the degree of the velocity and the agility was still very limited. Now as cloud native takes hold, the full ecosystem can participate to unlock further potential. So now let's look at the cloud native ecosystem that can be applied to automate and orchestrate these disparate systems. Now going into detail on each phase and project is well beyond the scope and time we have today. However, it's important to understand the breadth and completeness uh, developing in the open source communities and the collaboration that is ultimately enabling uh, the numerous contributors across business, application development, and various operations and security teams to work in concert with one, one another. Undeniably, at the heart of the cloud native ecosystem has emerged Kubernetes as the core container orchestration platform. Containers are a good way to bundle and run your applications. But in a production environment, you need to manage the containers that run the applications and ensure there's no downtime. For example, if a container goes down, another container needs to be started. If performance is beginning to lag, additional services may need to be started or rerouted. And Kubernetes ensures this behavior is orchestrated at a system level, bringing the, all of the resources that need to participate in a change or deployment and configuration um, are done through from the application level all the way down through the uh, acquiring the infrastructure resources. And so Kubernetes provides you with a framework to run distributed systems resiliently. It takes care of scaling and failover of your application and provides deployment patterns and much, much more. Uh, infrastructure is also actively participating in the cloud native revolution from projects that enable infrastructure as code to cloud native implementation of critical infrastructure runtimes, including compute, networking and service meshes, and persistent and business critical storage. Kubernetes can actively orchestrate the allocation, scale, and availability of these infrastructure resources in context of changing application needs. And this alleviates the burden of traditional system administrators' tasks with rigid deployments and limited orchestration capabilities. 
So where do you start? You know, there, all of these projects are out there and available for you uh, to tap into and, and utilize the beauty, which is the beauty of open source. Uh, but most companies that uh, try to go about it on their own and do what I call the DIY approach ultimately run into more overhead and management in keeping up with what's happening in the open source community, which projects are ready to go, et cetera, than is worth what the, the effort that they put into it. And that's where somebody like SUSE comes into play. Uh, a distribution that can bring all of the pieces together and deliver and ensure that you've got a, a set of packages uh, that work in concert with each other and are supported and lifecycle managed. You know, many of the open source projects will go through uh, multiple iterations, even in, in the realm uh, or the time frame of a quarter uh, or two. And determining which iterations are ready for prime time and production and which iterations need further uh, work and, and uh, stabilizing is the work that we put into the distributions every day. And so you should rely, highly recommend that you would rely uh, on a distribution vendor uh, to be the source of uh, how you go about that. And, and it's really uh, in this technology, uh, in ensuring that the technology is enterprise ready and viable for the long term. Uh, and we can also help you understand what skills you need uh, to develop and support um, the program. And so SUSE is really your strategic partner to help you achieve you know, this business uh, agility transformation. And as many of you have probably read about and, and heard, um, SUSE has, has uh, announced our intent to acquire uh, Rancher Labs. And, and so SUSE and Rancher will soon uh, be coming together to bring you uh, truly the, the world-class uh, ecosystem all the way from, from infrastructure at the Linux Foundation uh, up through container platforms and uh, Kubernetes uh, through a multi-cloud uh, hybrid uh, multi-cluster uh, operations and management. So I want to spend a minute here before I wrap up on you know one of our customers and, and what their results were and what their challenges were. Uh, it, were. Uh, API OMAT's mission is to provide enterprise companies you know, with agility to deliver new digital services faster. And they do this by simplifying the development of front-end applications for any device, uh, be it mobile, web, voice assistants, uh, chatbots, and now even AR and VR. And the key to API OMAT's offering is the flexibility to support different IT environments and the capability to integrate easily with existing business applications legacy systems and cloud APIs. And so to speed up their time to value that they wanted to deliver to their customers, API OMAT decided to containerize its software and they selected SUSE's uh, container platform to enable the quick and easy deployment of API OMAT in any environment from bare metal on-premise deployments uh, to public cloud deployments to managed service environments. And to offer simple solutions that are easy to set up in different environments, API OMAT needed a more efficient way of rolling out its client data centers. And to support client, uh, to support private uh, cloud on-premise deployments as well as public cloud implementations. So API OMAT standardized its software to run in Linux containers, which this, a, this uh, container platform, as we've already talked about, now gives us the, them the ability uh, to deploy their applications in any of those environments without uh, extensive retesting uh, across numerous platforms that they have had historically had to do. So API OMAT wanted a container management platform based on Kubernetes and a powerful open source solution. Uh, however, since Kubernetes can be challenging uh, to install, operate, and maintain, you know, they wanted to look for a solution that would minimize the time and effort required for them to set up and operate and maintain the Kubernetes environment. And that's really where SUSE, SUSE's container platform uh, sh shone through. Uh, as we run on a wide range of, of infrastructure, uh, including cloud platforms, 
and a key benefit of the SUSE container platform uh, over other container management solutions is its flexibility. Um, API OMAD customers can deploy their applications in any environment, be it on-prem as bare metal, virtual machines, private cloud, or even public cloud infrastructure. So they have, have really been able to achieve greater ROI, faster agility, supporting uh, more customers than they could uh, prior to this transition. Uh, and has really you know, resulted in, in growing their success and delivering more uh, satisfaction to their customers. So with that, uh, that's the end of my formal presentation. So I'd like to open it up uh, for questions um, that we may have, that the audience may have. And just as a reminder, if you have questions for Brent, please go ahead and add them to the Q&A box. You'll see it at the bottom of your screen. Thanks. I'm not seeing any questions. Brent, you must have done a very I thorough must have job. Answered, answered them all right up front, <laughs> which is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, Anyone have any questions? Well, if you don't have questions now and you do have questions later, uh, keep in mind you can reach out to us um, at our website. Uh, and then uh, you know, we can always follow up and particularly as we close with our rancher acquisition, uh, be able to get uh, more details on that. Oh, looks like you got a few now, Brent. Oh, yeah, I guess uh, I spoke too soon. Yep. <laughs> uh, let's see. Do you require uh, virtualization from SUSE or is VMware acceptable? Uh, this is one where you know our, we're wide open on that. So we run on uh, can support any number of virtualization environments. So yes, we can run you know on a, a bare metal SUSE uh, environment, or it could be run if you've got a, a VMware uh, infrastructure uh, and run run a SUSE container uh, environment. Uh, absolutely supported uh, in, by, in that environment, and we plan to continue that. Uh, that open methodology going forward. So absolutely uh, believe in a heterogeneous environment. Uh, see, do you see those deployments more on-prem, public, or in a mixed hybrid? Uh, do you see that mix changing in the next one, two, or five years? Um, it's a great, great question. Uh, I'm seeing more and more uh, in a mixed environment. Most people will do a first one, obviously in, a, in picking a very homogeneous environment. So that may be um, in the cloud or it may be on-prem. Uh, we've got a, a lot of customers going in both and I, I don't know the exact distribution, uh, but it, it can be done uh, in either. Uh, and I, I see, kind of much of the core data center, you know, over the next say two to, to five years, probably moving more and more to the cloud, uh, to public clouds. But that um, the balance of that, I would say, that will we'll always keep things in a very hybrid model is as edge emerges, uh, you know, edge is by definition uh, an on-prem uh, experience. And so regardless of the technology, you know, we see the container technology moving uh, to the edge and being able to be deployed uh, in lighter weight uh, implementations, you know, such as, as Rancher's uh, K3S, uh, a very lightweight edge targeted um, solution uh, that allows a, a hybrid model where the edge can be that, that point of presence interacting with the, the customers uh, gathering data real time, filtering that back and, and making localized decisions. Uh, but then after that data has been filtered, that can be then uploaded to the cloud for further analytics. And so we see uh, a big momentum in this hybrid application uh, where the application is federated across on-prem resources in edge or micro data centers uh, and connected and, and interoperating with 
uh, cloud deployments in, in one of the major uh, cloud distributions. Uh, SUSE's Container Orchestrator. Today, we've got a, a platform um, that is called CAS, a Container as a Service Platform. Uh, and we'll be kind of streamlining that. We have, we're still haven't closed with Rancher, uh, but we, uh, once that closes in the coming weeks, we will be putting together an integrated roadmap uh, and providing further updates on, on what that portfolio uh, looks like. But uh, uh, you can count on some continuity uh, going across from our current portfolio to the new portfolio. Uh, next question, uh, there's a question on how is SUSE agnostic in their choices um, and uh, let's say, is there lock-in or how do we minimize lock-in? Um, I'm going to turn it into the minimize lock-in because one of the things that's, that's quite different in, in how SUSE uh, makes their choices is everything that we do is, is open source, 100%. Uh, we don't have any proprietary extensions um, on top of uh, the products that we do or the, the code that we do. Uh, the other thing that we are very supportive of is a heterogeneous environment. And I already made one comment on this in, with the VMware question, is that whether it's our container platform um, or the container management, our current container management, and, and uh, you know this will continue on uh, another area that will absolutely continue on with Rancher um, is that we support a heter very heterogeneous environment. So it doesn't have to be an all or nothing SUSE uh, solution. Uh, if you need to intermix uh, some other vendor technology, you want to use uh, Microsoft uh, AKS for their container environment uh, with SUSE containers on prem, uh, with uh, say even a competitor. Uh, competitive container uh, environment and, and Linux environment um, you know, for another application, uh, we can help manage that entire estate. Um, our tools are, are designed in a very open manner and a very heterogeneous manner. So from a, a, a man, whether we're managing Linux, uh, we manage a, lin a heterogeneous Linux environment, uh, whether it's uh, SUSE or Red Hat or Ubuntu, um, we can do the lifecycle management of all of those. If it's our container platform or uh, AKS, when we bring on Rancher, we'll support uh, a multi-container, multi-cloud uh, environment there as well. So I hope that answers uh, that question. Um, are there plans to pursue AI ML strategies with SUSE technology and partners? Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, we are um, building out more and more of our AI ML uh, capabilities. Um, we support, uh, at the container level, we support uh, acceleration technologies today and support uh, many of the uh, most common uh, AI or machine learning toolkits. Uh, in the future, we've got some exciting things coming uh, with new products that you'll see this fall uh, on helping the data scientists also in the in full implementation of uh, machine learning pipelines and the management of those. Uh, so we, we definitely plan to, to invest more heavily there, uh, delivering that both in a, a bare metal uh, scenario uh, as well as a containerized uh, model in on-prem and in the cloud. Uh, uh, what was the deal size of Rancher? That I, I cannot comment um, on, so, but a, a nice question uh, nonetheless. So, uh, There's one question going back up to one of the first questions. Um, is any recommendation regarding security um, in, the, in the public cloud? Um, I don't have a specific uh, recommendation for the technologies. Uh, you know, it's, we don't uh, have a security portfolio uh, in and of um, ourselves, other than, uh, I guess there's security is a very multifaceted uh, area. So um, I'm going to re respond to that fairly uh, loosely in that, you know, we obviously focus very heavily on security of our products, ensure that they're engineered in a way to be as secure as possible and then helping with the governance of, of that infrastructure and its lifecycle management. 
from a patch management standpoint, um, ensuring that everything is up to date, it's compliant on a, a patch level, on a configuration level. Uh, we can do that with our tools uh, on-prem and in the cloud. Uh, so ensuring that your Linux environment, that your container environment um, is up to your specifications, your policies in configuration and, and uh, patch compliance. Uh, you know, we provide the tools for doing that. Uh, beyond that, from uh, intrusion detection, uh, further configuration management uh, and governance and application configuration management and governance. Um, we don't provide anything uh, specifically, uh, so it's a little bit uh, beyond the scope of, of what I could answer today. Uh, I think that's all of the current outstanding questions. Oops, looks okay, like here's, one more. Here's Sorry, Brent. Yeah, here's a, no, no worries. Uh, here's another one. This is a great, a great one. Um, mentioning that I mentioned that Kubernetes is difficult um, uh, to deploy, manage, etc. And there, there are plans to add layers to make this easier. Recommend suggestions. So there's multiple approaches, and, and we're supporting uh, numerous of those. Uh, I'm going to start with you know one to go all the way to the uh, abstract away Kubernetes and is the opinionated model. Um, we have a Cloud Foundry based solution called Cloud Application Platform today that really abstracts uh, the user from the developer uh, from Kubernetes at all. Um, everything's done behind the scenes, set up in, in workflows and policies uh, in the, the Cloud Foundry environment. Uh, set up and essentially as an opinionated uh, model and uh, you know that completely abstracts it so it's, it's extremely easy from a developer standpoint and then a small set of uh, Kubernetes experts uh, can manage the back end and ensure that's operating uh, at its easiest. Um, the next level of abstraction uh, is typically where a core team of DevOps experts uh, and Kubernetes experts would set up a custom uh, CI CD pipeline for uh, an organization. Uh, and you know, if they set that up uh, and roll that out as a, as a company standard, then developers can be abstracted from having to each repeatedly build um, their own pipelines and in their own uh, ecosystem and pull in many services that can be provided from a, a centralized core services team. Uh, that's probably the model that we see uh, being adopted, that I see coming on as, as probably the ultimate um, model. Uh, in the initial phases, it was either the completely opinionated or the completely uh, cowboy on your own, the developers on their own uh, model. Uh, and I think we're gravitating to the center um, where there's going to be that centralized uh, set of expertise that build, uh, uh, you know, customizable but uh, a CI/CD platform for inside a company, and as we move more into, you know, beyond DevOps and into GitOps, um, I think we'll see that even uh, evolve even further. Uh, for recommended training, um, you, if you go to SUSE's website, we've got uh, quite a bit of training. Uh, that we offer. We also have uh, training partners and um, the Linux Foundation um, actually has an excellent set of classes and you can become uh, LF certified as well on, on many of the technologies. Uh, and the last question I've got here is will we upload the slides after the presentation and, and yes the slides will be not the slides necessarily but the presentation itself is being recorded uh, and so that can be uh, gotten and reviewed uh, just in the, the LF uh, channel. Okay, well, very good. That was good. Thank I you thoroughly so enjoyed the session this afternoon. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to present. Thanks everybody that uh, attended uh, the event. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much, Brent, and thanks everyone for joining us and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and hope to see you next time. Thanks. Bye, everyone.